I'm going to invite you to turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're going to we're going to pray at call this the pastoral prayer. It's been something that has uh, been called that for many, many centuries. A time in which, when the when the church gathers. There's a certain time within the service where one of the shepherds or leaders in the congregation prays on behalf of the congregation, offering up our, our, confessing our sins, asking God for mercy, praying for our community, praying for our body. And so I'm going to do that in just a minute. I'm going to pray for the preached word. We have different people that will be doing those pastoral prayers throughout the Sundays. I'm going to do that this morning. But look at John chapter 15. You can have that there, and we're going to be there in just a minute. We're not dismissing kids this morning. It actually feels pretty full to me this morning. I, I, was, I wasn't sure what to expect if it would just feel really, really sparse. Uh, it feels pretty normal, and it's really a blessing to be with you. It is a real blessing to not just have Mike on the other side of the camera and either I was standing here watching and recording to the video, or I was maybe standing here looking at the video, or I was in the back, or I was outside. It's really, I'm looking around at you, it's really good to see you. It is, it is a gift to be together in person. It is meant to be a means of God's ministry of grace in our lives, that we would build up our our hearts to love him more as we grow to love each other more. Each of us have been changed over the last almost four months, whether for good or for bad. We've been changed. We've been stretched. And, and what shape have we been stretched into? For some of us, it has felt like spiritual victory, and for some it's been feel, feels like spiritual defeat, or just, I wish I would have done this different, or I, I, it, this sure showed me something about my life, and I, I'm not excited about that. I need to grow in greater character or greater discipline. I had a lot of time to read the Word, but I didn't read the Word. Regardless of where you are, God is disciplining. He's discipling. He is growing his people. He's pruning them. Know that God would minister to us right now. So would you, would you bow your head and, and just for a minute, would you by yourself to God, lift up your prayers, confess your sins, call on the name of the Lord and ask him for help for the, the remaining of this, remainder of this time. And then I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into the word. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us as a people. I pray that you'd make us a people after your name. We'd be after your name, in your name, through your name, a people, a house built up for your name. It's a family. And I pray that we would be a family in Christ. I pray that we would love each other with Christ-like love. I pray that you would allow us, by your grace, to spend Years and years and decades and decades together, growing in Christ, helping each other, being an iron, sharpening iron, helping each other follow Jesus. I pray that we would together be lights to the world. I pray that you'd bring people of different backgrounds and colors and ethnicities into our church and that we would display the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. That Jesus would be all and in all of us. God, this morning, I pray. I confess our sins to you. We are a people undeserving of your grace, and yet we received it. We turn the other way. We go our own direction. We're prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. Oh, God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our lust. Forgive us of our greed. 
Forgive us of our selfishness and pride and vain glory. Forgive us of the ways in which we depend on ourselves or on other people rather than on you. Oh God, I pray that you would help us to become joyfully reliant people on Jesus Christ, Father. I pray, God, that you would give, teach us the joy of that reliance. I pray that you give us desires to see your presence in all things. And I pray that this morning we would experience the presence of your Spirit's power in this room. God, I pray that if there's anyone in here that has, yes, whether they've professed Christ or not, if they're not saved, you would save them and you would give them life for those that are saved. And that would be most of us by your help, by your grace. I pray that we would have our faith rekindled, strengthened, nourished. Give us alertness over this next 30 minutes. God, I pray, Father, that we would love your glory more than anything for us that have, for that to happen, you need to change our hearts because we're just so prone to loving our own glory or being captivated by other glories. I pray, God, that we would have wholehearted obedience. And of course, that must come from you. I pray that we'd, we'd find it a joy to be obedient to you. I pray that because we trust in you. I pray that we would love as Jesus loves and of course, that's a miracle done in our hearts. It's an evidence of your birth in us. And oh God, I pray that we would not love each other with just any carnal, just normal worldly love. I pray that it would be from you. I pray that we love our neighbors. We would love our community. Oh God, have mercy on our land, the divisions in the church and outside the church. Oh God, forgive us of sinful, wicked hearts in our land rebelling against you primarily in Jesus Christ. And, oh God, return us to you. You turn our nation to you. Turn our nation to Jesus Christ. Oh God, would you give us a heart of repentance and grief over racism and over rebellion of authority? Oh God, I pray that we would not seek solutions apart from Jesus Christ. Oh God, I pray that you would be with those who have experienced the pain of bigotry and racism, and you'd give them healing. And I pray that we would not take part in that. Instead, we'd take part in any repentant spirit. I pray that you would call us to that. I pray that you would be with police officers. I pray that you'd remove those that are wicked and, and hurtful. But I pray, praise you, and I thank you for the many, many troops, troopers out there deputies and officers that are serving our communities, and I pray that you protect them and give them grace and wisdom and bring them to Christ. I pray that you'd be with the black community in our country. I know that they're not all united in any way, but I, God, I just, I pray that you'd give mercy and grace to them and to all of us. I pray that we'd have enough humility to not think that we have all the answers, but we know that you do. And I pray that we'd have listening ears, caring ears, caring and sympathy sympathetic hearts. I pray that you would make us like Christ to this community and to this world. Help us to abide in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that the word of God that we now will listen to, we would be not just hearers only, but doers. Oh, for that to happen, you have to do that. That's why we ask you. And we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Where we look there, I want to ask this question. It's some, a question that I ask my, my sons at least every once in a while. I'll, I'll see them doing something in the kitchen or walking around the house. And I'll say, son, what are you listening to? And usually I have to say it really loud. Hey, son, what are you listening to? Because they have headphones on or earplugs in. And, and they might take them off after I get their attention. And they'll, they'll, they might tell me. And... And I want to ask you that question this morning. What are you listening to? What message and person or persons are impacting what you're listening to? There's a lot of noise out there. There always has been a lot of noise out there. Coming from the world, from the media, from online, it, the internet, social media, from friends, 
There, there's voices that enter into our minds, not the voices that you hear that you need to go to counseling for. I'm talking about just the voices that you hear telling you things might be, how could God continue to forgive you after you keep sinning like this? Or you, you just really are, are not, you're just not going to make it. You're just, you're a loser. Or you are the center of this world. There's, there's a lot of things that I hear, fears, and I deserve this, messages. And, and as we regather as a church after 14 weeks, I want us, by God's grace, to set our ears and be quick to hear and have ears to hear the messenger of truth that, that must change our lives, and that is Jesus Christ. We need to hear what Jesus says. Last week, we heard Jesus says, come to me. Oh, I pray that you'll, you won't stop hearing that message. Come to Jesus. Come to him, you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to him. Next Sunday, I want, I want to share a message that says, go. So come, go for me. Go do what I've called you to go. Go be my disciples. Go make disciples. And this morning, I want us to hear this message from Jesus that says, Jesus says to us, abide in me. Faith Church, abide in Jesus. I know that sounds like kind of a churchy word, abide. We don't use that unless we're singing a song, abide with me or something like that. Abide means remain, stay connected. Don't go anywhere, dwell with me. Faith Church, abide in Christ. Why does he say abide in me? It's, it's June, in fact, it's now officially summer. The last time we met was winter. Um, it is summer, June means we're getting our crops in if you're a gardener. That would be my wife. It's probably some of you. A lot of farmer friends that I have, they've already got their crops in it, whether it's their, the, the fields are planted or your gardens are in, and you're already watering, you're cultivating, you're weeding, you're preparing. And, and you do that because you want to be able to say, at the end of this season, during harvest season, it's been a fruitful year. It's, it's really been fruitful. You want to you see it, you want to enjoy it, and we want to we gather together and enjoy the fruit of our harvests. We're all thankful that farmers, that gardeners, are preparing for fruit. Jesus says, abide with me, because you were made to bear fruit. I, I pray that we would yearn as a people to bear fruit for God. We would, we would long to, God, we would make it an earnest desire of our hearts as a church and as individuals. Oh God, help me to bear fruit. Help my family to bear fruit. Help my son and my daughter. Help my parents to bear fruit. Help me to live today fruitful. John 15, 16, you see here, says, you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It's earlier, he says, and you can look at verse 1. It's a very familiar passage. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he prune, or every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch, that's who we are, we're branches, we're Christians. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you, anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish 
and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As a Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, I will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be full. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lays down his life for his friends. And you are my friends. If you do what I command you. Faith church. Abide in Christ. Friends. If you're here this morning and not yet a believer. Come to him, receive him by faith, and then remain in him, abide in him. Don't go anywhere else, but stay in him, stay connected. Why? To bear fruit. What is, I mean, we throw that, I want to be fruitful, spiritual fruit. What does that mean? Spiritual fruit is what happens when God is glorified by Jesus' life being displayed, manifested in our character and our actions by the Holy Spirit. Fruit is the outcome of being connected and the evidence of his work through us. We are to cling to Jesus, and the result of us clinging to Jesus is fruit. What, what is, do you want to be fruitful as a believer? Young people, God has saved you in order for you to bear fruit. Grandparents, God has saved you and has kept you here in order for you to the dying, your dying day, for any of us our dying day, to bear fruit. What might that look like in your life? It's whatever it is, it's the result of I'm connected to Jesus. And it's what Jesus wants to produce in us where we look and go, that's not Jason Moles, that's Jesus. That's not Tammy B. That's not Donna, that's Jesus working in. And it could come in so many ways. For you, fruit might be the work of God growing your relationship so that when you go through health crisis, financial crisis, through, I mean, just struggles in our culture, watch the news and you have reason to get discouraged. And and instead of being discouraged, being full of anxiety, you go... I put my trust, my hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I have, I, he is my strength and my hope. Even though my body is wasting away, my, my inner man, my inner spirit is being renewed day by day. I feel it. I love Jesus more. Even though the hard things of my life are still coming, it's grace in my life. That's fruit. Or fruit might be You, the timid you, nervous you, you the person that doesn't have words for others, rarely has anything to say encouraging or spiritual to someone else. He's growing you to read this book on a regular basis and and now you're sharing it with other people. Just, you share a text with someone. Hey, I'm praying for you. This is what encouraged me in God's word. Keep looking to Jesus. And you do that to your neighbor. You're nervous. What is he going to think about you? You're, you're a Christian. He's going to judge you. He's going to have a higher standard for you. I don't care. I just want my neighbor. I want my lost family member. I want my family, my, my friends, my coworker, my classmate. I want them to know Jesus. And I don't care. I'm finding myself not caring what they think about me. Because I'm learning to love Jesus more. And I want him to be seen. That's, that's fruit. Or fruit might be Pastor Daniel. Or you say to someone else. This is amazing. I've, I've wanted to pray more. And I, I'm praying more. I'm not bragging. I'm not telling you that so that you can pat me on the back. I'm actually giving it as a praise. Because I know it's not from me. I've been getting on my knees more. And I've actually found myself talking to him more and taking everything to God in prayer more and I keep seeking him, that's fruit. 
or it's being spiritually aware of the needs of others. And you see them, and instead of being so self-focused, so focused on your own rights and your own ways, you, you start to show compassion to the very people that were just so frustrating to you before. You were so annoyed by them. Now you have welling up in you some humility and grace and kindness, tenderness. Because, because as you read the word of God each day and as, as, as you think about how good he's been to you, as you keep going to him and just pondering how much he loves you, you realize they're no different than you. In fact, the only difference is, is you've received more mercy from God. He's saved you, and maybe he hasn't saved them yet. That's fruit. Fruit can come, come in all kinds of ways, but it's the result of Jesus' life being shown in our life. Do you want Jesus' life being shown in your life? I want it. What? We, we don't even deserve to exist as a church if we're not fruit bearers. Okay? Jesus saved us to bear fruit. Let's just close church. Let's not even gather if we're not going to be bearing fruit for God. If the world looks at us and just sees labeled Christian, but nothing else, we actually hurt Jesus. We're just really bad messengers. We are there to look at us and see Jesus coming out of our lives. And that is, that is humbling. That is heavy because what us, weak, broken sinners, by the way, if you think of yourself as weak, broken, sinners, messed up, really needy, that's the beginning of fruit starting to come into your life. Because the beginning of it is, man, I am desperate. I need something else. And that's the point of Jesus saying, you're a branch. Branches are worthless if they're connect, disconnected to the vine. We need to be connected to Jesus. We need to remain in him. Here's the good news. It is God's intention for us to bear fruit. You are not too big of a sinner. You are not too ungifted of a person for God to use you and to work in you to make you a fruit-bearing person. Uh, without going into much, because I just want to talk about well, what does it look like to abide in Jesus? I just, I just want to remind you, they might pop up on the screen, but I'm not going to focus on that for a minute. In this passage, he just gives us three reasons why we should bear fruit. He says, God's glorified. The Father is glorified. When, when we bear fruit, God looks really good. And that's what, if we're Christians, that's something we're growing to love. Oh, Dad... I'm starting to manifest sonship in you, and others get to see how good you are. You're glorified. Another reason we should want to bear fruit is it proves that we're real. We're really his disciples. If we don't bear any fruit, you don't have any reason to be assured of your salvation. Okay? If we're not bearing fruit, ultimately, that doesn't mean we have valleys and struggles. We're not perfect, but a person that goes and lives their lives with no fruit, no evidence of Jesus coming out in our lives, in our active lives, even if we prayed a prayer in the past, there's no reason for us to be assured. He says, by this you shall know that you are my disciples, in, that you bear fruit. It says that in verse 8. The last thing we should want to bear fruit is there's nothing more joy giving. If you look at verse 11, Jesus says, I'm telling you this. Just think of the, the intimacy, the care about this. And he tells this to you, to us, Faith Church. He says, I tell you these things so that my joy, Jesus is the happiest human that has ever lived and is still living with supreme joy in the Father. He says, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I realize not all of you are really joyful people. And sometimes it's not, it's outside of your control. Sometimes you, you, you say, I want to be joyful. It's just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm discouraged. Sometimes it's because of our 
physical wiring sometimes. Some of us are more inclined towards that. It's not always a spiritual thing. But over time, God intends for us to have a type of joy, a type of satisfaction in Him, a delight in Him. And is God's grace and God's mercy as we grow to be bearers of fruit in our lives. There's a, there's a joy of saying, I, I live for someone else. I, I get to display him. Look at, look at what he's doing in me. It's not about me. It's about him. So in the remainder part of this message, I want to conclude the last 10, 13 minutes is this. How do we bear fruit? Or how do we abide in the vine? That, how should we stay in Jesus so that we'll bear fruit so that we can manifest Jesus, not myself, in our lives. I, I wrote down four things this week. Four things that, I know we don't have bulletins. We're going to have those probably in, starting in July. We don't have bulletins right now. They're, they'll pop up on the screen. And I, I put them, I see them in the text. But I wrote them in the phrases of four prayer requests to the Father. Do You notice a couple of times where Jesus says, if you'll ask the Father in my name, he will give it. Jesus wants us to ask the Father, saying, Father, will you do this based on what Jesus has done? Father, will you do this? And I think these are four prayer requests that relate to abiding. And I called them faith or prayer-filled pursuits. Because we need to pray, God, will you do them? But don't just pray them, pursue them. But don't just pursue them, pray them. Because you can't, you can't produce anything apart from God doing it. But God doesn't want you just to sit around and wait for God to do it too. You pray and you ask God to help you and you say, and then you, you seek it. So here are four prayer-filled pursuits of abiding in Jesus that bear fruit. Number one, we should. Here's the prayer. Prayer number one. Father, teach me the joy of relying on Jesus in everything I do. Teach me the joy of relying on Jesus. The heartbeat behind this passage, when Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, and then he says, you need to bear fruit, but you won't bear any fruit unless you're connected to me, remaining in me. Apart from me, you can't do nothing. The point here is to say, you better rely on me. And I want to say it this way. Would you, this is worth you writing down in your note, putting in your phone, and making this your daily, maybe five times a day prayer, send it as a reminder. Because when I reread this, it kind of recalibrates my day to keep abiding in Jesus. Father, teach me the joy of relying on Jesus in everything I do. So I get up, I'm really tired. <laughs> but this is an opportunity, but my tiredness is an opportunity to rely on you and the joy of seeing you work, not me. Okay, I... I'm not looking forward to this meeting today. God, give me the, teach me the joy of relying on you, not my own strength or my own personality or my own ways. God, teach me the joy. Teach me the joy that humbly embraces my neediness and cries out to you, God, I'm needy, but you are sufficient. You see, God's people learn to get really comfortable with knowing how needy they are. And that's why our posture regularly is to get on our knees if it's literal or just figuratively, meaning we're driving in the car, oh God, I need you with your eyes open. And, and we, God, I need you to help me today. Or young people, as you get back, you get going into your summer schedule, you might feel so messed up. Teens, you ever feel like you're just wasting your days this summer? It's hard. And your probably parents might tell you, you're wasting your days. You're on the computer. You're on doing this. Maybe it's, God, help me today to rely on you. Help me to know what today should be. Show me how to use this day to glorify you. Help me to rely on you and teach me the joy of relying on you. Last, yesterday, I was, I was getting ready for the service. This room was empty. I was thinking about this morning. A little nervous, thinking, boy, this is the first time since March. I was praying up here on the stage, and I felt dead spiritually. I didn't even, I didn't feel comfortable. I was like, man, I don't even feel, I didn't feel excited about my sermon, even though I knew it was truthful and good and right. And I was like, and then it hit me. This is 
This is an opportunity that Jesus is giving me to rely on him and not my feelings at the moment. I feel really encouraged right now, maybe because you're listening, um, and I pray because of the spirit working. But, but I had to say, God, thank you. I get to rely on you even to preach the sermon. Teach me the joy of relying on you in everything I do, including preaching my sermon. Oh, that we would learn that. Let's be, whatever, whatever you have this week, that's prayer number one. Prayer number two is this. It's all about abiding. These are pursuits. Father, teach me to desire the glory and presence of Jesus in everything I do. Teach me the, the, to desire it. You see this? These first two is the joy of something and the desire. This is, this is about something getting in our hearts. Not just, I'm going to just determine to do it. Oh God, you change my desires, change my wants. Teach me the desire, the glory, and presence of Jesus. You might wake up and feel like, man, my parents told me to do these tasks today. Or you wake up and say, I need to get this done. Or you wake up and go, I got this at work, and it's really frustrating. Or you wake up, and whatever it is. Or you might say, I know I need to reach out to my neighbors, and I haven't been. And I, I, I need to do this and I haven't. And I need to start being in God's word, but I haven't. Make it your prayer, God, teach me to desire your glory and your presence in everything I do. God, teach me today to actually want your presence in this room right now. If, if we believe the Bible, Jesus is present with us in his spirit right now. He's present in the trials. He's present in the joys. The reason why I get this in this passage when he says, abide in me and I in you, there is a sense in which we should invite and ex be excited about saying, Jesus, you intend to be in me, not just me connecting to you. You, you promised to go with me. Teach me the joy of your presence. Teach me the joy of your presence when things are hard and I can just stop and go, but you're in this. When your parents are, are being really difficult for you to get along with or your children are or your siblings are. Imagine that as an opportunity where Jesus' presence gets to be shown in your life. And you get to look up to him relying on him and say, it's about you, not me. That's fruit. And I think it's an act of abiding by us just making these kinds of things our prayers, our heartbeat. It is becoming God-centered, Jesus-centered in all that we do. We are called to have a, a relationship with Christ. Not just we do things. He intends for us to desire Him. Would you listen to God this week? Will you go to his word each day asking his presence to be with you? Asking for your desires to change? Slow down to hear him. Have time in the word. Prioritize. You realize that the most important relationship in your life is Christ. You want to grow to know him. It's number two. And the third thing that I want you to see is just, here's a third prayer request. Father, Teach me to wholeheartedly obey Jesus in all that I do. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the last two. Father, teach me wholeheartedly to obey Jesus in all that I do. I want to hit this next week as we talk about going, as a via make of disciples. Teach me. The whole point here is abide in me by obeying me. Don't say you're remaining in Jesus, and when he tells us to do something, you go, that's optional. We are to be marked by doing things that Jesus wants us to do that our hearts are not always inclined to want to do at the moment. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The, the, the point here is you're going to have an effective prayer life, but not until you start really loving to do what, obeying him, letting his word abide in you. And that word of his word abiding in you is not just, I memorize a lot of scripture, which we should, but it means 
seeking to obey him? Are you obeying him? Are you doing what he has commanded you? Are there things in your life that you know he wants you to do in regards to your parents or your kids, or in regards to your siblings or your work or your neighbor or your own personal habits or fighting against sin? Maybe you need to be baptized, become a member. You need to start giving like you ought to. You need to serve. You need to be discipled or discipling. You need to be in God's word. You need to maybe change a job because you know it's keeping you from doing what God wants you to do or you need to be leading your family spiritually, but you're not. You might be, need to have a new attitude towards the lost or witness to your friends. You need to get help to fight against porn or other addictions that are destroying you, but secretly and no one else knows about. You need to get out of a toxic relationship that's just dishonoring to Jesus, whatever it might be. The act of abiding in Jesus is saying, God, help me to wholeheartedly obey you. And it might be an act of abiding in Jesus that will produce fruit is for you to make one act of obedience today. God has called you to do. The last prayer focus or pursuit that I just want to give to you, and I see it in this text, is, Father, teach me to love Jesus. Love like Jesus in all that I do. He says this, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. We're going to see these last two next week as we talk about go for me. But brothers and sisters, Faith Church, Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. He died on the cross that we might have life. He gave himself for you to forgive you. If you're here this morning and you have never received the forgiveness of sins, I invite you to come to Jesus. I invite you to the life of fruit bearing by first coming and realizing there's no life but in Christ. And if you will come to him repenting of your sins, he will save you because he came to this world and he died on the cross for everyone who turns away from themselves, opens their arms to Christ and says, please forgive me. Please receive me. Please give me your life. Oh, I pray that you will know the Savior love, the sacrificial love of Jesus, and then show it to others. Abiding in Jesus is a life that says, Father, teach me to love like Jesus loves in all that I do. It means some of the hardest people in your life, the most difficult people in your life, give you the greatest opportunity for you to practice this. Oh, that God would help us. Oh, that God would Help us to grow in this affectionate pursuit of abiding in Jesus. May we bear fruit. Oh, that God would help us to hear what Jesus says. Abide in me, faith church. Abide in me. Bear fruit by clinging to me. It's not about what you do first and foremost. It's what I do in you, through you, as you cling to me. Let us make these things our prayer filled pursuits. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team as we conclude the service. Let's, let's pray. Father, I do pray that we would be ushered in by your grace, the kindness and the strength of Jesus. I pray that Jesus, who is strong and kind and tender, would help us to abide in you, Father. Oh, Father, Help us to abide in Christ. Please make these our, our pursuits in Jesus' name. Amen.